August 9, 1945, a United States Army Air Force B-29 dropped a 10,000-pound plutonium bomb nicknamed Fat Man over the city of Nagasaki, Japan, three days after Hiroshima. Line from the Hindu scripture, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I suppose we all thought that one way or another. In the cities, the Japanese lived in rubble. In the countryside, bad harvests cut the food supply in half. While Americans urged Japan to stick to toys, bicycles, and cocktail napkins, Japan put all its resources into steel mills, cars, and electronics. They protected and nurtured those key industries. It was a system of centralized economic control. Government working with banks and big business for national goals. Hi everybody! Japan is one of the most incredible nations of the 21st century. And while most of us know Japan as a fully developed, super fast country, what we don't know is that back in the 1940s, Japan had every possible obstacle for failure. They suffered a massive defeat in World War II, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings had shaken the spirits of the Japanese, they had very less natural resources, and the economy was suffering one of the worst setbacks in its history. But within just 23 years, something crazy happened, and the same country went on to become the second largest economy in the world, beating giant countries like France, Britain and even Russia. And because of this incredible growth of Japan, today it is known as the economic miracle of the 20th century. The question is, how did this little country go from ruins to becoming the second largest economy in the world? How did they achieve this in spite of having such a small population and very less natural resources? And most importantly, what are the lessons that India needs to learn from the extraordinary rise of Japan? This is a story that dates way back to 1945. This is when the devastating World War II came to an end, with the Japanese suffering a massive defeat in the hands of the Allied powers. And if you remember what happened in World War II, for Japan, the war ended with the horrific Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings in 1945. And as you can imagine, after the bombings and the war defeat, Japan as a nation was in complete ruins. Military forces were disbanded, leaving 1.3 crore people unemployed. The factories that supplied arms and goods to military lost business. Per capita GDP of the country dropped by 47% as compared to pre-war period. And the industrial production reduced by 90%. As a result, there was hunger, starvation and poverty all around the country. But this is when the US occupied Japan and empowered the government to revamp the economy. This is why Japan became an instrument for US control in Asia. So as soon as they came in, Japan lost the right to have an army and was allowed to have an army only for self-defense purposes. And this was one of the most important moves that changed the face of the Japanese economy. The question is, why? Well, if you look at defense in terms of return on investment, you will see that the government has to spend 10 lakh rupees per soldier per year to train him, pay him and feed him. But if the same 10 lakh rupees is invested into educating an engineer, he'll be producing an income for the government by paying taxes. Now multiply this number by 10 lakh soldiers versus 10 lakh engineers and you will see that it translates into a billion dollar impact on the economy of the country. Now mind you people, I am not saying that soldiers are useless, I am stating a fundamental fact that military spending, although necessary, leads to an enormous burden on the economy of the country, especially in a country like Japan during the post-war period. In this case, the military spending of Japan became so less that they were practically spending just about 1% of their entire GDP on military from 1960 all the way to 2018. Now the question we hear is, Japan was in ruins after World War, right? Then how did these people find jobs? Well, this is where, ladies and gentlemen, the Japanese came up with something called the Kiretsu model. And this system gave rise to some of the most powerful Japanese companies in the world, like Nippon Steel, Toyota and Mitsubishi. The question is, what was so special about this system and how did it work? Well, if you look at how automobile companies operated in America back in the 1960s, you will see that a giant car company like General Motors would have multiple suppliers, and these suppliers would have manufacturers who would then again have raw material suppliers. And these US companies worked with a cutthroat contract and cost efficiency. For example, if General Motors has a sunroof supplier, this sunroof supplier would have its raw material suppliers like glass supplier, screw makers and semiconductor suppliers, and they would then have their own suppliers like steel suppliers and silicon suppliers. Now General Motors would strike a deal with the sunroof company whereby they sign a contract for 5 years at a cost of $40 per sunroof. 
Now after 5 years if there's another supplier B who is willing to offer sunroof at a lower price of $35 without a thought this sunroof company will be fired and the next company will be brought in. Similarly due to oil price hike if the glass supplier to the sunroof company decides to hike his price and the cost of manufacturing of sunroof goes up to $39 what will happen the company will have to sell to General Motors at $40 with just $1 of profit which is very very bad. So in this case the supplier will be pressurized to keep his margins at just $1 because of the contract. So General Motors in no way will bear the burden of the supplier. And lastly, if the supplier's factory itself catches fire, General Motors will just move to a different supplier. So you see, the company acts as a completely different entity, does not indulge in the operations of the supplier and does not take any risk of the supplier. But you know what guys? The dealings of the Japanese Kiretsu model was the complete opposite of this. In this case, First of all, the entire cluster of companies including contractors, subcontractors, manufacturers and suppliers are supported by a core company and a major bank. This group is what forms the Kiretsu. And all these entities own a stake in each other's business. For example, Toyota might own a 4% stake in the supplier's business. The supplier would earn a 0.25% stake in Toyota. The supplier would then own a 1% stake in the manufacturer's company and the supporting major bank would own a stake in all these companies. And instead of having a short term contract of just 5 years like the US companies, Toyota makes a rock solid relationship with its suppliers for 20 to 30 long years. And here's how beautifully they function together as compared to the American companies. Number 1, let's say there is a supplier to Toyota who needs 10,000 tons of steel to manufacture his parts. So, if the cost of steel spikes, the part manufacturer's cost would shoot up, right? Now had it been a company like General Motors he would have no other option but to sell the part at lesser profit. But what Toyota would do is since they order 100,000 tons of steel anyways this time they will place an order for 110,000 tons of steel. So if the manufacturer orders 10,000 tons of steel separately he would get it at 26,000 yen per ton. But now that Toyota is placing a huge order of 110,000 tons of steel they would be able to procure it at just 20,000 yen. and after procuring it toyota will just pass on the extra 10000 tons of steel to the supplier so if you see the manufacturer gets steel at 6000 yen cheaper cost as a result the cost of the part manufacturing gets lowered without hindering the profits of the supplier at the same time toyota gets parts without price hikes secondly if the part manufacturer is having troubles with profits like if she is expanding her warehouse and faces a crunch due to off season then the supplier in normal conditions will not have the capital for expansion right But in the Japanese system the bank in the Kiretsu very easily offers a low interest loan to the manufacturer such that the company would have enough capital to expand and as soon as the cash flow comes back to normal they could pay back the bank loan this way expansion becomes easier even if there is a cash crunch and thirdly the most astonishing principle that i found about the Kiretsu model was that these companies also share their research and development and their engineers within the Kiretsu And this is where the just-in-time system came in as a game changer. To tell you about it, Toyota spent millions of dollars to perfect the just-in-time manufacturing model. And for those who don't know, back in the 1990s, car manufacturing was done in just-in-case method. As in, if there are three color variants of a car, there'll be 500 red cars, 300 black cars, and 200 white cars already manufactured and stored in the warehouse. So, as soon as you place the order, the car would be handed over to you. But with the just-in-time system. Only after you place the order for a black car all the spare parts will be ordered from the supplier machines will be started the entire car will be manufactured and then it will be painted black this way the waiting time of the customer increases but at the same time it drops the cost of production by a large extent why number 1 it leads to very less wastage so in this system it would never happen that there is a waiting list for black cars and red cars are lying in the warehouse with no demand if 200 black cars get ordered exactly 200 black cars will be produced if there are no orders for a red car none will be produced the second benefit is the extraordinary level of cost cutting in simple words if you look at the size of land needed to place 300 cars do you realize that space is huge similarly if you look at the labor inventory raw material electricity that is used to make 300 dead stock it is insane when it comes to cars and on top of that if you took out a loan to scale up your manufacturing the interest rates will again kill your profits so ultimately the cost of this wastage and additional interest is passed on to the customers with increase in the price of the product but in the just in time system since there is no question of having a dead stock in the warehouse 
the same production could be done at less cost with less manpower less land and less capital in fact this system was so so efficient that other companies that used jit saw 50% decrease in their inventory and 80% decrease in their lead times eventually they saw a massive increase in their profit margins in this case from 1955 onwards toyota's production started shooting up so much that they made 22786 cars in 1955 46417 cars in 1956 78856 in 1957 and by 1965 they achieved a production growth of almost 2000% producing 477643 units in 1965 this was the genius model that toyota had developed because of which it became the biggest automobile manufacturer in the world and you know what guys after spending millions of dollars into perfecting this model toyota sent the entire blueprint of just in time and its own engineers to apply the same model for their manufacturers and suppliers so just like toyota Even the manufacturers were able to produce parts with less land, less equipments, less manpower and less cost. Eventually what happened? The cost to Toyota decreased and again the entire Toyota supply chain benefited without hindering the profits of the manufacturer or supplier. Similarly, if there is a fire incident, the banks and other companies would come together to help the supply chain recover with loans. And when this kind of incredible support and resources were provided by the Kiretsu companies to each other it gave them three incredible benefits to progress in the global market number 1 the suppliers because of the safety of the contract boldly invested into their research and development because of which they became better with both cost and efficiency and with each passing year they just got better and better than their foreign counterparts Number 2 because of consistent profits the companies are able to pass on their profit to the employees in the form of perks increased salaries and extra benefits and last and most importantly because of the close knit support coordination and resource sharing all the entities in the supply chain made money and at the same time instead of focusing on short term goals like cost cutting and contract they focused on building the best products in the world and needless to say as we all saw kiretsu companies like toyota sony and nintendo did not just go on to dominate japan but the entire world itself and cherry on the cake when america let japan sell products in the us the japanese did so well that they ended up beating the best companies in the world in electronics automobile and even shipbuilding as a result because of these kiretsus like mitsubishi nissan and toyota millions of people got jobs exports of products shot up and japan started growing so fast that it became the second largest economy in the world in just 22 years and last and most importantly it is the incredible spirit of the japanese people that made an extraordinary impact on their economy long story short the japanese government just like the indian government offered lifetime employment with benefits so that the workers could feel safe but as you also while indians became complacent and turned government organizations into sluggish bureaucratic and law stricken companies the japanese people worked super hard without compromising on their quality of work to turn japanese companies into world class organizations this is how by cutting their military spending by building an incredible business cluster with the kiretsu model by sharing their research and development with each other and with the incredible grit and hard work of the japanese people Japan went on to become an economic miracle of Asia. Eventually, it rose from the ashes to become the second largest economy in the world. And this brings me to the most important part of the episode and that are the lessons that we Indians need to learn from the iconic rise of Japan. Before we move on, just like Japan's leadership and support gave rise to incredible companies, our partners at scaler.com intend to offer world-class mentorship and training to help you get incredible opportunities in the best companies in the world. scaler.com is a transformative tech school wherein you get to learn from the top people in the industry. That is why they don't just act as mentors but end up becoming your life coach. long after you're done learning with scaler these instructors are practitioners themselves and not just lecturers who just know theory scaler's major focus is on skills and not the degree today software development and data science are those domains that offer some of the highest paying jobs in the world and if you want to upskill yourself in these domains scaler.com is one of the best options available in india the best part is that 
most scalar learners get the opportunities at big tech and product companies like Amazon, Microsoft, etc. And also, there is an average 126% CTC hike as per an independent assessment report. So if this sounds useful to you, check out Scalar.com from the link in the description and sign up for a free live class to experience the scalar difference. Moving on, the first thing we need to learn from Japan is that the unfortunate truth of geopolitics is Pride comes at a cost. In this case, do you imagine how difficult it would have been for the Japanese to accept help from the same country that dropped nuclear bombs on them? But the Japanese swallowed their pride and used the US relations to get protection as well as access to the American markets. And this is what built the foundation for their growth. Lesson number two, conscious capitalism is the undisputed instrument of economic acceleration. In this case, we saw this quite evidently with the growth of the incredible Kiretsu model companies like Sony, Toyota, Nippon, Toshiba and even Mitsubishi. And last and most importantly, the attitude of the people is the most powerful instrument to a country's prosperity. And no matter how many policies you come up with, if the people are complacent and do not have the attitude to grow, the country will never progress. So you decide for yourself as to what kind of citizen you want to be in the growth story of India. That's all from my side for today guys. If you learned something valuable, please make sure to hit the like button in order to make YouTube Abba happy. And for more such insightful business and political case studies, please subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next one. Bye bye. Also guys, before you leave, please don't forget to check out scalar.com and register for their free live class. I am keeping the link in the description and in the pinned comment for you. 